the Mind Body Connection podcast. The body and mind. With your host, Dr. Phil Parker. So, welcome. A um, real pleasure to have Reese Thomas on today, um, who I met recently, and I was really intrigued by his story, um, which I'm not going to spoil by giving you any highlights because I'd like him to kind of tell it to you. But I think it fits really well with the podcast we're doing, which is the mind body connection. So we've talked a lot about on the podcast about the mind and the body um, and how they connect. And uh, what we're moving towards now is people who have real stories that are quite significant. And I think just listening to the conversation and the story will open up all sorts of interesting thoughts and conversations for people. So thank you so much for joining me, Reese. Uh, tell me a little bit about you. You can have the floor. Tell us your story. Right. Um, absolute pleasure to meet you, Phil. And yeah, thanks for giving me a you know a platform to be able to tell my story. And uh, I hope maybe it can resonate with people and you know help people. If anything, that's you know that's kind of where I am now. But a little bit of my background is um, you know I I started um, I was born in South Africa. Started my journey, went, you know, came from a working class family, very outdoorsy, full of, you know, full of the joys of life, you know, mischievous. But, uh, you know, went to great schools. My high school had a big impact on my life. And um, it's where I really found my love for, for rugby and also made friends for life there, which I still to this day, you know, they ended up having a huge impact on my life. Um, which, I'll, which I'll come to tell you in a minute. But, um, yeah, so I had an opportunity after school to to go to Wales to pursue my career in rugby, because my whole life, all I ever wanted to achieve was to be a professional and eventually one day international rugby player. Rugby was my passion. And it was just... How, do you, how did you get to be a, playing rugby in Welsh, Wales if you're uh, South African then? Well, my... Um, my dad and his parents were, were Welsh. And, you know, I moved over in November of 2000. And, you know, I've been here now 20 years. But it was, I mean, it was such a roller coaster. I was, I was a young lad. You know, my whole family stayed in Joburg. Um, my mum, dad, brother, sister, you know, my, all my aunts, uncles, cousins, etc. And off I went. And, I mean, it was, so, it was an amazing time. It was so, I, it was exciting. You know, I had no one to tell me what to do. And I mean, I loved rugby, but I, you know, I, I love partying. It was, it, it went hand in hand. So, I, you know, ended up before long, got my um, Welsh and 19th cap, went to World Cup in Chile, ended up going to World Cup, uh, under 21 World Cup with Wales and playing in the Six Nations and 21s level. And, you know, slowly by slowly, all my dreams as a youngster were starting to come true. And it was it was just and it was an amazing roller coaster, you know, of which during that time I struggled because I was I was um, I felt homesick a lot, you know. I felt um, I felt alone at times, but a lot of the time to take my mind off that loneliness and homesick, I would you know get into you know a bit of trouble with on the weekends and you know doing doing what rugby boys do after matches. But, you know, mine was maybe a little bit more excessive than most. So, um, so it's just, let's pause that for a second. So you felt homesick and lonely. Is that, uh, is, are those kind of emotions allowed in a South African young rugby buck? Is that normal? Is that yeah, acceptable? Well, obviously, at, at the time, I wouldn't have been able to probably even describe them as an emotion or, an, or a feeling because... Other than you know feeling homesick, which I did at the time, uh, it's been that's through reflection in the last kind of seventeen months, being able to look back and you know see it for what it was, and that to not feel you know to, even from that young age, I wasn't dealing with my emotions and feelings well. I you know I would you know if I did feel any feelings or strong emotions that I couldn't live with, I would just go straight to the old tried and tested, which was alcohol and um it wasn't always alcohol it was other things as well but um that was my go-to you know yeah. but i mean still I, I had the ability and and you know i had a gift basically and rugby was my gift 
And I found out very early on, like, I got to a bit of a situation where my off-field antics were having an impact even at that age. By the time I was 24, I went on my first Welsh tour. Um, my contracts were, you know, I signed my first pro contract by the time I was 21. And, you know, I got my first cap in, against Argentina in Buenos Aires. And that was an amazing day for me. Obviously, my family were incredibly proud. And um, it was just like a roller coaster from there, if I'm honest. It was just, it was almost overwhelming at times because, like, all these dreams that I'd ever had were playing out right in front of me. And that, you know, I'd, I'd also started a family. Um, I'd met my wife. And there was just so much going on because there was distractions all around me as well. Because as you, obviously, you can imagine, as you come into the limelight, you, you get an international recognition, you're in the press, you're getting attention. Um, my ego was growing. Um, and this brought its own set of problems, uh, if I'm honest, because, you know, I, I thought I, I started to believe in and form an image in myself that was false. And, um, you know, an arrogance, almost like a narcissism that started to come out, not so much in my normal self, because I've always been, you know, when sober, a completely lovely person most of the time, you know. But, like, obviously, with alcohol in me, it was just... I was the other way. And I was never an aggressive drunk, but incredibly boisterous and just mischievous, getting up trouble constantly. And trouble was never far away. You know, it was, I was, I was destructive. And um, that was even, that followed through me through my career. And before long, you know, I, I had, did some amazing things. Obviously, we won the Grand Slam in 2008. I met, I had the privilege of, you know, meeting, um, Prince Charles, Prince William. Um, I met, you know, the, probably the highlight of what my career allowed me to do is I met Nelson Mandela for one of my rugby matches. He was my, like, my hero, you know. And, yeah, there was, it, it opened so many doors. But there were doors that I, I couldn't shut, you know, things I couldn't say no to on the weekends that started to hinder my performance. And not only my performance, straight, put strain on my relationship. And it's slowly but surely that spiral um, of chaos out in my, in my personal life started to come into my professional life. And you could see it with my performances. I was getting injuries. You know, I was never the best professional, like, training-wise. But, you know, honestly, normally on, on game day, I'd bring it, you know. Um, but it was something that definitely started to catch up with me. And slowly but surely that uh, my international career started uh, ended because of, you know, there was a lot of issues off the field going on. And um, it was unfortunate. You know, I had gone from, that's all I ever wanted. And I achieved as my childhood goal was to put an international jersey and Welsh jersey on and walk out in, the, in front of the Principality Stadium and, and, be, a, be an international rugby player. And I achieved that. I achieved my goal. And it brought me incredible, you know, I was very proud of my achievements, you know, because I'd done it all, you know, I'd left at 18 years old from, you know, my home country and got myself to, to the top, like with very little help from anyone else. And um, it, that also became a later issue because when I started to have problems with addiction, et cetera, I didn't want anyone else's help because I just thought I'd done this all myself. I'll fix it myself. And that attitude, you know, that stubbornness, that, that pride, that ego, actually drove me a lot further into a hole than I'd ever, ever imagined. Unfortunately for me, and my lifestyle was out of control. And in 2012, I suffered a heart attack. Uh, well, how, how old were you? In two, I was 29 then. Phil. 29. And you were still physically pretty fit? Yeah, I was playing professionally for the Lenethi Scarlet. Um, I, you know, I just agreed a new co a contract to move to a club in France um, on, you know, the most money I'd had ever in my career. And literally in uh, January of 2012, I was just training in the gym and boom, massive heart attack. 
Um, I knew it was a heart attack because in 2007, and I, I'd had a, a smaller incident where I'd had a heart attack, but it was a clot in my artery. So from, they said, from impacts and from training um, and maybe excessive caffeine, but they weren't sure. In 2012, then I had my heart attack and I walked across the gym into the physio room, told the physio, Pat, I'm having a heart attack. I lay on the floor. I didn't want the boys to see me. You know, even in that moment where I knew I was having a heart attack, it was that still that pride was to not be seen like, no, don't show him weakness. So I went down the corridor and just sat on the floor. And I waited for the ambulance to come. And I uh, ended up then going to the Morriston in Swansea. And before I knew it, they said I needed to have an emergency bypass, and which I did. And I woke up then and um, I'd had a quadruple bypass and my career was over. I, you know, I was asking the doctors, when will I be able to play? But I was you know, still coming off the mor on morphine and stuff like that. And I was really sick. I was incredibly fortunate to survive the operation. They gave me less than a 30% chance of surviving once they opened my chest. And um, yeah, it was, it was hard. The recovery from that first heart attack, my quadruple bypass was incredibly challenging. It was not only physically challenging because I was very ill, because I'd had a huge loss of muscle in my heart. So uh, about 70% of my muscle had died off in the heart attack. So, um, and all on the, on the left side. To even walk 100 meters was, I was completely out of breath. I would change color. I'd be sick sometimes. Um, and all in the, in the space of about a week. So I'd gone from being a professional athlete, just agreed my biggest contract of my career, my international career had maybe finished, but I hadn't, I hadn't given up on that. And I was hit the best, I was more or less at the best form of my life when I had my heart attack. And just like that, boom, taken away from me. And that physical battle, although I, you know, I did not want to die, so I tried my hardest to to stay healthy and 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 to fight, but it became a very big mental battle you know, dealing with the loss of my career, the fact that I couldn't even walk up a flight of stairs without stopping, stopping three times. Um, it was really tough. I had panic attacks, anxiety, stuff that I never even knew about um, that was just there when I woke up. I couldn't sleep. Like I, I was like falling asleep and waking up, like not being able to drop off because of I was having panic attacks. And uh, that was really hard times. And I mean, um. As my health slightly improved from that heart attack, I then had, um, I needed to have a heart transplant, I was informed, but I actually could not have one because I had pulmonary hypertension. So it was just this constant roller coaster of emotions, you know, it's like you need a heart transplant. And then I, they'd drove me through the, the, the probabilities of survival, et cetera. Um, and just, it was just every day it seemed that there was a different curveball being thrown at me. Um, but I just pushed through, you know, and then in, tw in 2014, I got offered a machine that they could put in me that could reduce the pulmonary hypertension because they gave me about 12 months to live in 2013. And I was like, right, that's not going to work. So I said, what's the options? And they said, well, you can either just you know, live it out or we can put this machine in. And, this, and I was like, okay, well, machine it is. You know? It's not even, let's, let's go. But there was obviously a lot of scar tissue under my chest for my for my first operation because it was an emergency. Um, it actually took, I think, just over 14 hours. I did somehow survive that operation as well, but I didn't wake up two weeks post-op. When I woke up post-op, it was, you know, I was really, really sick. I was very skinny. Um, my legs, I'd kind of, you know, my muscle atrophy in my legs was really bad, so I had to, like, use, like, a, like a thing like this to go to the toilet with. And it was really, I mean, it was tough. It was real tough. My recovery from then, it took me a month to get out of the hospital, believe it or not, from, from when I uh, woke up. Um, and that machine, although it comes with its issues, was completely life-changing. Um, it's actually a, a machine called a left ventricular assist device. So they, it's implanted on the left side of my heart and it sucks the blood out of my left ventricle and pumps it through a uh, pump into a tube and goes back through my aorta. And the blood's actually pumped by a machine through my, through my body, but via my heart. Um, so you don't have a pulse, which is, was quite weird to get used to. Um, right. so you're just constantly flowing. 
and there's an external wire that comes out of your stomach and it to uh, two external batteries which have about eight hours life and they they keep me running so if they run out of battery i've got to swap them and in the evening i plug into that remains so it was a big life change mentally it was a battle a battle which i was really struggling with but on the exterior i know i was showing people you know smiling yeah i'm good things are great when in fact things were not great at all and um, you're in this phase were you like taking care of your health or were you drinking you were alluding to drinking before what happened with that yeah so during this process when i was you know very ill and recovering from these operations multiple operations you know many months in hospital um it gave me a lot of time to to live with these emotions without actually accessing um through no other person to blame by myself i didn't want anyone else's help you know like i said that stubbornness that, that pride um that ego that no i'm fine don't worry that was my go to word and you know, if anyone asked me i was no i'm fine and um you know fine is i i got a my sponsor says something about it but i don't know if it's appropriate for this conversation so maybe i'll do for that word beginning with f <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um it was just crazy like and when i obviously as my health started to get better then things started to go downhill um with alcohol so you know i'd say by off my off was in 2014 i'd say by 2015 halfway through 2015 i'd started to drink again and i had a uh, fluid restriction at the time two and a half liters of any fluid in a 24 hour period so that was what including water and i slowly then started you know found the two pints were not enough because it was too much fluid it was a liter so then i quickly changed to well what spirits could i have so i started whiskey then gin then it was uh, vodka and you know how much of that neat could i drink or well, just with a bit of ice because it reduces my my fluid intake um and then probably unfortunately for me i i i discovered red wine and um this was you know i could drink a lot of uh it well you know if i drank two and a half liters it would do the job um so to speak but wasn't as vile as the other drinks i suppose i never really liked the taste of alcohol which was bizarre you know and i just continually drank it just because i was checking out of my reality So it's really interesting isn't it you know you you didn't drink when you were super ill and yeah that wasn't enough to break that cycle that when you got well enough you were starting to creatively work out how you could manage your volume intake uh, and get the maximum amount of alcohol in your system yeah interesting okay so then what happened yeah so basically then there was just an absolute downward spiral of those it, you know it became you know a liter of vodka on a saturday became you know more closer to a liter and a half vodka and god knows how many shots um and then then it became a friday and a saturday and then a friday saturday and a sunday afternoon and then sometimes a thursday friday saturday sunday afternoon you know and the intake of alcohol this whole time was was slowly increasing and the strength of it was was getting more and more because i knew that the more i was drinking the more fluid that was so the less mix i could have or the less ice i could have you know these this is the lengths that i was going through in my mind to to fool myself into thinking that i wasn't doing any damage because i wasn't going over my my fluid intake when in when in fact that wasn't doing the damage at all i was basically pickling my heart but what little of my heart was left you know and the unbelievable thing was the mental decline during that period was was intense and i did not see it I, everyone around me all my loved ones my family my wife my ex now ex wife it, 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 they were begging me my mother would ring me in floods of tears after you you know because i'm on the heart transplant list i've got a machine that runs my heart batteries that have a 8 hour shelf life yet i'm going out on the town or going on stag do's going abroad and get in absolutely paralytic not knowing where i am get in arrested for falling over or breaking something because i can't even remember doing it like complete and utter desperation um i not only was i a sick man in health i was a completely sick man in mind um i had 
no idea what addiction or alcoholism was. I didn't believe in it because I think I didn't drink Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And I, and I can take it or leave it for a week or two either side when I had really bad hangovers. So I, was, I, I fooled myself to believe in how could I possibly be, I'm not dependent on alcohol. Because I had in my head this picture of a, you know, a guy sat on a street corner with a brown paper bag. When in fact, you know, that, that's not the case at all. And um, it was a hard time. It was really bad. And unfortunately, in the end, I, I pushed away everyone that was trying to help me. And I just surrounded myself with enablers, people that enabled me to drink, that didn't give me any, any chip for when I wanted to get howling or smoke cigarettes when I was drunk, things that were just absolutely absurd to do with a man that's on a heart transplant list, you know. And it's just really unfortunate. I mean, it was a, it was a sad state of affairs for and I'm, I'm imagining your relationship started to fall apart at that point as well. Oh, I mean, it was it was dire. Um, you know, my my wife is, was an in is you know my ex wife now is she's an amazing person and she and she you know we're no longer together but I have zero resentment and only just respect for the how many times she tried to protect me and tried to help me and how many times I just didn't want to know. And um, unfortunately for me to realize because of the amount of denial I was in of how bad my problem was, I, I actually had to hit my rock bottom um, because I could not see the wood for the trees. It was literally stone wall, three kilometer deep denial. And um, unfortunately, well, I say fortunately, luckily no one was hurt. I crashed a drunk on the 1st of, um, the 1st of September. And 2019, and it was a it was a complete shambles. Like I got home, and it, you know nothing. I mean, luckily, with the, it, the the damage was not great. I didn't. No one else was affected by the incident, um, nor myself. And but the damage at home was you, you know, my children and my elder son, um, who's 20. Ethan, um, unfortunately. You know, it was, it was a, it, the family was at breaking point and especially, you know, my wife had had enough at that point. And it was, it was a, it was, it was a disastrous day, a day that will stay ingrained in my mind forever, but it was enough to make me realize that there's a problem. Hear the rest of Reese's story in the next episode. The Mind Body Connection Podcast. The Body and Mind.